You are muted. I'm here. How are you? Good morning. Okay. Hello. How are you? Thank you for joining us. Excellent. So uh, we just uh, began our event. So let me uh, give a uh, warm welcome to all the attendees uh, of our uh, co-organized uh, panel uh, between uh, the Center for European Union, Transatlantic and Trans-European Space Studies uh, and the uh, European Parliament Liaison Office in Washington, DC. So we have a, uh, a uh, excellent panel on transatlantic digital trade uh, with a very uh, distinguished uh, keynote speaker. Uh, and uh, before we begin uh, the event uh, and the discussion, I would like to ask uh, uh, Joseph Dunn, uh, who's the director of EPLO, to talk uh, a bit about uh, what EPLO does, and then also Professor Yanis Stavaktis, who's the director of uh, our center here at Virginia Tech, to uh, introduce our center. So, uh, Joe, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Besnik. Um, I won't take much time. It's a, a great pleasure for us in the European Parliament Liaison Office to do this event jointly with you. We were established 10 years ago to foster relationships between the European Parliament and the US Congress. And we also work with academic partners uh, like yourselves, especially uh, Jean Monnet Centers of Excellence. And we think uh, what we're doing, particularly in the COVID times and the pandemic times is uh, making as many connections as we can uh, between the parliamentary committees. And we're doing that on issues uh, of common concern, uh, issues that feature the uh, global agenda that was set out in the uh, European External Action Service paper of early December, and which I think reflects uh, the European Union and the European Parliament's preoccupations. And one key element of this is uh, technology, how we work together to regulate the digital economy in the transatlantic and the trans-European space, uh, to echo the title of your institution. And I think this falls in, into several different areas. It covers tax questions, it covers uh, regulation of online platforms, uh, digital services, and it covers antitrust issues and the uh, digital market issues for which uh, Andreas Schwab is now the rapporteur in the European Parliament. And it's a great delight for me uh, to be speaking at an event together with Andreas, um, whom we, I had the pleasure of working with Andreas for a number of years on the Internal Market Committee, uh, where Andreas was the ranking member, I think, to use the US terminology. And um, really, I have actually wanted for some years to introduce Andreas Schwab to a US audience. Uh, so this is the first time we've, we've managed it and we're very happy, very happy to do that. So thank you, Best Nick. Thank you for giving me the chance to put an EPLO stamp also on this event. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Giannis? Thank you, Best Nick. Good morning and good afternoon, depending on whether you're located in Europe or in the United States. Uh, my name is Yanis Tivaktis. I'm the director of the Center for European Union Transatlantic and Trans-European Space Studies, which is a Zamone Center of Excellence. It's a new center, uh, so we work slowly but steadily in improving it. Uh, the center is based in the College of Liberal Arts and Human Sciences in the University in Virginia Tech, but it's open to all departments and colleges in our university. Uh, we're involved in teaching, research, and outreach activities. We support graduate and undergraduate academic programs, but we're also involved in uh, activities pertaining to K-12 education and lifelong learning programs. Uh, we are happy that we have this event today. I'd like to thank my colleague, Besnik Pula, for putting this excellent panel together. I'd like to thank the Parliament Office, the Liaison Office here in Washington, DC, for partnering with us for this event. And I'm looking forward to working with them for many more events in the future. So I'd like to welcome all of you today in this very important panel. And I give the floor back to Besnik. Besnik, the floor is yours and thank you for everything. Thank you, Yanis. Uh, so, uh... 
we are very honored to, uh, to have a, uh, a keynote speaker uh, for our event today. And uh, because he has uh, 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 kindly given us his time, uh, we won't, I won't take too much time uh, discussing the issues, which we'll have some time to discuss after the keynote address uh, during the panel. Uh, at which time you will also have a chance uh, to ask uh, your questions as an audience. And so we will engage with the panel. Uh, but before uh, uh, getting that, I want to introduce uh, our speaker. So we are very pleased to have Andreas Schwab, who is a member of the European Parliament and has been a member uh, since 2004 as a representative of Germany, uh, as a member of the European People's Party. Uh, uh, Mr. Schwab is uh, the EPP coordinator of the European Parliament Internal Market Committee, in which uh, he has been uh, an advocate for the uh, Consumer Rights Directive, uh, the Network and Information Security Directive, uh, the Directive on Antitrust Damages Actions, and the Directive on the European uh, Competition Network. And he is currently working uh, as the uh, uh, European Parliament's uh, rapporteur uh, with regard to uh, the regulation of the Digital Markets Act, uh, as well as the report on digital taxation, both areas that are uh, very pertinent uh, to our topic today on transatlantic digital trade. So without any further ado, uh, I pass the floor to uh, Mr. Schwab. Thank you very much. Uh, a warm welcome from Freiburg, my constituency, where I'm at the moment in my uh, parliamentary office, in my constituency office, more concretely, and it's my pleasure that I here in the afternoon in Germany can speak to you in the morning in the US. And it, uh, it's a, a very nice proof of how close we are, not only uh, digitally now, but also from the values that we defend all together. And um, I'm very happy that I can address you here from Freiburg because the Freiburg School of Economics uh, at the Freiburg University, where I was also a scholar of, has after the second world war introduced into the German economic uh, um, and policy, the, pr the, the principle that we wanna fight against oligopoles. And this has been there far before uh, big uh, tech giants from the US have been appearing. It was a conclusion, a consequence of a very difficult time in German history. Because we have been observing at the beginning of the last century that the oligopolic structures in the German economy have helped democracy to fail and Hitler to get power. It was not a direct effect, but it was a very strong element that has in the uh, society helped um, um, this uh, distortion of democratic processes. And we have been concluding also as Christian Democrats coming here from Freiburg, where I'm an MEP for, that in German history, never again, we will allow big companies to control um, the markets, but by this we wanted also to express that we will never again big players dominate our societies and dominate our democracies. And I believe after having read and listened a lot to the debate that is currently going on in the United States of America, um, and I'm very grateful for Joe Dunn who has been working with our committee for quite a long time as a director and I, we have still a very friendly contact and I'm very happy that we can uh, here be together today. The US has also understood that this is also a key driver for um, our biggest partner in the Western world and um, that also your economy will never fall into the hands of a few because you have so much in the US, you have so much economic strength, it would be a burden if this is limited by a few companies. You want this chance for every citizen to be available, for every economic player, if they play, if they abide by the rules, everyone has the freedom under the US uh, main reflection to develop his own business. And that's what we wanna achieve. So our aim is not at all with the Digital Markets Act for which you have invited me to speak, is not to, uh, it's not to limit innovation. It's to make sure that basic principles
unfortunately, it seems that we've, we, we've lost our speaker uh, due to internet connections. Um, so if you bear with us, maybe for uh, a minute, we'll try to get him back. Apologies for that. Uh, Okay, here we go. Sorry, we lost you there for a minute. Sorry for that interruption. Uh, I don't know if it was an unfriendly act of uh, whatever secret service, but in any event, I will stay with you until the very end. And yes, even if you don't you. hear me anymore, we will uh, remain in a very close touch because it's important that we start together on this important piece of legislation on both sides of the Atlantic from the same uh, basic principle. We defend uh, fundamental values that are not only in the European Union, but also in the US constitution enshrined as basic principles for our societies. And I think we can have maybe some different points of views on specific elements, but on that key principle, I believe very strongly that we will always be aligned and we always want them to defend, uh, to be defended and to defend them together. Therefore, I would like um, uh, to say this as a starting point, as uh, some doubts have been there in the past as to whether the European Union wants to fight against the United States on this. Not at all. Also on digital taxation, we have been seeing with Janet Yellen taking over the office um, of a US Treasury Secretary that in the end we have exactly the same principles. We want that businesses pay a fair contribution to societies and for that there are, is taxation. And it's up to the member states in the end to decide what level, but Principally, they have to contribute. Now, why do we speak about these basic principles in that area? Because we have been seeing that the laws that we have at the moment in place, which allow in the competition policy area only for an ex post evaluation of market distortions, have been far too, too, uh, too, too small, far too little, and far too late. And to cope with this problem, we have been saying that we need a more ambitious and a more um, a, a stronger tool to make sure that the, the, the rules that we have on our markets are respected also in big uh, tech. Therefore, we believe with ex ante regulation, we can make the social market economy uh, again the basic uh, guiding principle also for digital markets. The EU objective is beyond competition law. It's contestability of markets. We don't want to put any of the players into troubles, but what we want to achieve is that if there are new players coming into the game, they have a fair chance. And I have to tell you, um, um, dear colleagues, uh, dear Besnik, uh, dear Yanis, dear Joe, that when I was uh, working on this issue in 2014, it came very clear to my mind that this is a, a battle that is also in the United States between companies that have already been there before the digital age started and companies that came in later. And there was also a very clear observation that within the United States, there is exactly the same economic question as outside. How can we make sure that they keep all the same values in place and they respect all the same law? That level playing field that we want to maintain and that we have been hoping to achieve uh, in the analog economy, we also want to keep in the digital economy. And for that reason, the Digital Markets Act, as proposed by the European Commission, that has been brought to our uh, committee, and I have the pleasure to be the rapporteur of the European Parliament on this, is to define gatekeepers. Gatekeepers are nothing bad. They are very successful companies, probably, but they have a very strong control on data, data in several so-called core um, digital platforms. And these core digital platforms are defined by the European uh, law. And if there is a player who has a lot of market power in these areas of, um, um, of, of key platform services, then um, they will be considered as a gatekeeper. And for these companies, they have to be very, very big, probably more than 100 a billion a year. Um, there are some so-called do's and don'ts, rules that they have to respect that are stemming from the existing laws that we have already in place, but rules that unfortunately 
have not been respected in the last three years and where the European uh, Central Authority, the European Commission had difficulties to impose on these market players these rules that are in place. And therefore we want to outline these rules a bit more precisely. And the question will be, do we, have we, do we have the chance to outline all these rules already in detail now, or will we discover with innovation going forward that new rules will come into existence? And therefore we have to keep on the one side a very clear core of elements with precise rules, for example, a ban of self-privileging of services, but at the same time, we need also a certain flexibility to introduce new rules when we decide, or when we see that markets decide to change. And we need also some flexibility for these clear principles to be adapted to specific market situations. The best example that I have always invented myself is what do we do if Facebook wants to invest into a market platform and asks regulators in the US and in the European Union as to whether they get the right for some years to keep self-preferencing their service users for their own market platform. Because like that, we will come back maybe to a contestability of online markets in the um, um, search uh, of, of, uh, of goods and, and, uh, and products. And that could thereby helping to create higher contestability. So we have to be smart and flexible on the basis of very solid grounds and clear rules. And that's the aim of Article 5 and 6 of the Digital Markets Act. Enforcement, back to the roots, and a European antitrust touch. This is the closest part to the antitrust procedure. Uh, power of interviews, down rates, interim measures, and commitments is Article 19 to 23. And there is a very clear part of antitrust investigation. But here, in that part of the Digital Markets Act, it works in complete different ways. It's not used for the designation of the gatekeeper as the first part of the law. Um, or for the implementation of the obligation, because the Digital Markets Act um, uh, has the change of burden of proof. There is a presumption of being qualified as a gatekeeper on the basis of the criteria in Article 3, and it's up to the gatekeeper to implement the obligations, not up to the European Commission to impose it on them. And the only uh, uh, complementary powers for the European Commission for monitoring and possibly um, intervention in case of a procedure once triggered is not probably carried out by the gatekeeper as a condition. So you will see that after having introduced the concept of gatekeepers, after having introduced the do's and don'ts, there are two procedures where the European Commission can um, get in touch with these companies. Um, this is once the Article 7 procedure, which is rather a regulatory exchange or a very uh, strong uh, procedure which is close to dawn rate, but which takes more time and has to be more uh, uh, proportionate than the first one, which can in the end also uh, be um, with uh, ending up with structural measures. And we do that because we believe that innovation is broadly brought into the market also by the giants, but we want to have a chance for other companies to flourish in that market again as well. And therefore we have to keep these markets opened. And like that, um, I think, um, uh, if you allow me, I can already conclude. I hope that I have uh, given you a, a certain insight uh, from the uh, Parliament of the European Union. And I would like to conclude, uh, dear Besnik, um, that we need to find the right balance now with that legislation. Um, we should not uh, be too negative on these companies. Um, about big tech in general, but we should try to steer the legislation in a way that we help them to continue uh, with their useful activities, with their partly excellent services. And at the same time, um, we should make sure that others can enter the market again. We should make sure that these big tech companies offer services that all consumer use every day. And let's not forget, they have brought into the world and they have brought also our worlds closer together. We wouldn't be uh, today able to exchange on that level if these companies would not help us uh, with tools and services. So we need to have an internal market in the European Union that is increasingly thriving, increasingly innovative with a level playing field where all players can be in fair uh, competition. So what we want to say, and this is a little bit of a provocation from the time when I was starting to use computers, um, we have to say game over. 
game over to unfair trading practices, game over to that to, to killer acquisitions that limit innovation and have led to unfair competition conditions. And we have to say, yes, um, we can achieve fair markets. Yes, we need the big players, but there is also space for newcomers. And yes, we can do that together. And we will, and we have to be also convinced about that, uh, colleagues. We can achieve that to be done on the basis of fair and trusted uh, constitutional principles on the uh, European side, but also on the US side. And therefore, I really look forward to work closer, not only with you from the Virginia Tech Conference, but also with our colleagues from US Congress, because we have to get that right. It's important for the future of our economies. And I would even say it's important for the digital future of this world that we are living in together. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Schwab, uh, for that uh, very rich presentation uh, and very informative. And uh, I think, uh, with a lot to discuss and a lot to think about, uh, given the wide range of issues that uh, uh, have been raised and are um, ongoing in terms of the uh, growing role of the digital economy that as Mr. Schwab pointed out, you know, in the era of COVID has been very critical in even enabling us to do things like uh, discuss uh, today with an event like this. Um, so uh, I would like to uh, now uh, turn uh, to our panel and we were able to get uh, all our panelists uh, online and, and you know overcome some technical problems. Uh, we're very happy to have everyone here to discuss some of the issues that Mr. Schwab has raised uh, with regard to a whole host of things uh, 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 based on uh, a set of uh, values in terms of uh, the, the, the role of uh, markets and competition uh, in transatlantic uh, trade to issues of uh, regulation, um, uh, what in US parlance, we would call antitrust in terms of uh, the role of competition of gatekeepers uh, and how they affect uh, transatlantic uh, trade relations uh, more broadly. Um, um, and also related to this, the issue of taxation, which is quite critical in terms of uh, both uh, the taxation of the digital services uh, within and across uh, uh, international borders. So uh, I will now turn to uh, our panel and we will have uh, um, a, uh, as I said, distinguished uh, 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 set of panelists. Um, I will not present all the details of their bios uh, in the interest of time, and um, 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 I will uh, simply present them by uh, their current title. Uh, but uh, we will start, uh, and I will go by the order in the program uh, with Mr. Benjamin Angel, who is the uh, director uh, at the European Commission. Uh, for uh, 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 direct taxation, tax coordination, economic analysis and evaluation, and also acting director for indirect taxation and tax administration. Uh, so Mr. Uh, Angel, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Besnik. I can say a few words on what I know, which is a tax part. The digital uh, sector, is a sector which presents specific challenges from a taxation point of view that you don't really have for the rest of the economy. Um, the main characteristic of any digital company basically is that from anywhere in the world, you can serve the rest of the planet without having a physical presence. And that creates new challenges for the tax system because the way tax system have been organized for more than a century is that you tax companies which are located in your jurisdiction. Uh, today, uh, a very large part of the uh, profits of digital company, uh, which are generated all over the world, are not taxed by the countries where those profits are generated, but rather by the, the countries where they have their seat. And this triggered uh, an important discussion which started in 2017 already in the OECD framework, the so-called inclusive framework, a discussion that uh, gathers a large part of the planet. Since we have 139 countries participating to this discussion on how to agree on a mechanism to share not the taxes, but the taxable base, that is, you identify 
a portion of the profit of the multinational that would be redistributed between what is called the market jurisdiction, that is the countries where the digital company are effectively operating and making their profit. Uh, the scope of this discussion, which started as a purely digital discussion, has been uh, extended already on a request of the previous American administration uh, to cover also non-digital company. What has been discussed until very recently uh, was the idea of sharing a fraction of the profit, what was considered so far was sharing 20% of the profit above the 10% profitability threshold uh, for uh, companies having a turnover above 750 million euro. Uh, there was a digital component and there was another component which was consumer facing businesses covering other sectors on the request of, of the Trump administration. Uh, obviously, you have pros and cons behind all approach, but the main difficulty attached to uh, what was discussed so far was that there, there were many, many companies in scope. And this is clearly a challenge for the tax administration because the way it works, you need to uh, not only come to a global agreement within the OECD on having an ambitious multilateral convention to make it happen, but once you have it, you need to have an agreement between all the tax administration concern on a company per company basis on how to share the profit for a given company between the, the countries where it operates. And obviously this is challenging. And the importance of the challenge is a direct function of the number of companies covered. And this is where uh, the uh, new proposal from, from the new administration uh, comes the new proposal uh, that the US administration have made is to simplify the process by focusing only on multinationals, very big one. Uh, the, the, the US uh, government have proposed a turnover above 20 billion euro and to have an agreement only for those one. It, reduces significantly the number of companies in scope, so we make it easier to handle. Uh, it does not have such a big impact in terms of profits to be shared, because de facto those companies, they're, they're already the, the very profitable one, but it does make the agreement a little bit less digital, because so far we had a clear uh, negotiation with uh, a digital dimension, now we are talking potentially uh, of a set of company for which six or seven companies only operate in the digital sector out of the uh, 90, 95, 100, depending on the final design that would be covered. The big names are there, but they would be there alongside many other um, names. Uh, that will certainly uh, trigger interesting discussion in the months to come. The, the agenda is quite tight. The objective is to uh, get to a deal on the broad lines by July, and uh, if possible, on the broad lines and the fine prints by October. Uh, that uh, is not impossible. There is clearly an impetus and a strong will globally uh, to get to such an agreement. But it is challenging because you have a very large number of participants around the table and uh, the uh, views may uh, diverge, but I would say we have never been that close. As far as the EU is concerned, we are strongly committed to support the process. We, we believe in an agreement, not only on digital taxation, but also on minimum taxation of corporate, which is the other pillar of this negotiation, a very important one. And we stand ready to transpose any agreement as quickly as possible in Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Angel. Uh, so we see uh, uh, how, uh, in a way, uh, these uh, domestic debates in the US about uh, corporate taxation are also uh, influencing these uh, debates at the international level, especially with the EU with regard to taxation. So that's something that we can also discuss. I would just like to remind the audience that uh, there is a Q&A button uh, on your Zoom, and you should feel free at any time to post questions to any of the panelists. 
uh, and we will get them. Uh, uh, we will get to them um, at the end. But feel free to enter your questions as we go along, uh, and uh, we will have a, a time to also uh, discuss some of these issues uh, with the panelists. Uh, so next, I want to turn to uh, Professor Francesco Duina uh, from uh, Bates College, where he is a professor of sociology and European studies, and also a member of the uh, Jean Monnet uh, uh, Network on Transatlantic Trade Politics. So, uh, Professor Duina. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for having me. And, uh, I'm going to basically talk in uh, somewhat broader terms uh, about the issues that we're discussing today. I know a lot of the audience members are students as well. And I'm going to say about four, four things that perhaps help contextualize and see this, this question, these important questions about digital markets and services in a broader context of transatlantic relations and, and the use place in the world. And I'll just say four things and leave it at that. Uh, the first that is uh, quite interesting to think about is that the EU uh, is, you know, is a standard setter in the world historically, and that's how it exercises often its power. It's a sort of soft power of setting standards, and it does so first usually internally with regards to the single market and maybe other areas. And it's a it's a big single market, right? And then uh, it uh, it has a history of successfully, if you will, um, projecting those regulatory standards. Uh, onto the world because of its of its economic uh, power and because it tends to get its act together, in a sense at, at times uh, before other actors get there, and I think this case here today that we're talking about is a good example of that. It's an example of uh, the EU in a sense moving ahead of, in this case, the United States and other actors, and thinking about how we're going to regulate uh, uh, this world. The interesting thing I think that is worth thinking about here is as well, is that in this case, with regards to the United States, the companies involved are actually from the get-go foreign companies, really. You know, you really heard that uh, with regards to both um, Benjamin and Andreas and what they talked about, obviously the references with this big tech from the United States. And so in a way, what's interesting to think about as well uh, here is to, to realize that as the commission and the parliament think through this, they're actually envisioning and thinking in relation to American companies for the most part. Uh, although of course, as well, domestic companies as well. So it's a, some, almost like a defensive, a reactive in a sense, there's a flavor of that that comes out. And that's a little bit unusual for, I think, um, the EU to do that in this, in this way. The second point concerns the question of values. And I think Andreas talk, talked about this already. Um, in, in the past trade trade agreements that the EU went into and other actors at the transnational level were really simple, simple, right? They were customs oriented, um, tariffs oriented agreements. The new generation of trade agreements are much more regulatorily oriented and seek to standardize and harmonize often regulations and approaches that different parties bring to the table. And we saw that with uh, TTIP, um, in the past in North America, and it failed uh, with the United, between the United States and, and the EU around precisely things around regulations, particularly GMOs and uh, home, the use of hormone in beef, which caused an enormous uproar in the EU. Uh, it was heavily politicized. People in the streets never seen that before, really. Uh, the same thing happened with the uh, EU-Canada, uh, the CETA agreement, uh, though that one was eventually ratified and well passed and now it's basically ratified. So what I'm getting at here is that underlying these very technical things that we're talking about um, and specific things, there are questions of values. Now, what do we value as Europeans? What do the Americans value? What are we gonna assert through these regulations? What values and principles are, are we going uh, to assert? And this requires thinking on behalf of, um, of citizens of the EU, of course. And here you typically see uh, often differences in approaches between the EU and the United States in terms of what values are being asserted. But I would also say that in addition to values, there's also the question of identities. And that is, we're not only saying, here's what we value as Europeans, we value the protection of consumers or and so on and so forth or, uh, or, or competition or in a certain uh, way. But um, we're also saying, here's who we are. Here's who we are in the world. Here's what we stand for. Here is our identity. 
And I would even add that in the process, uh, the EU itself gets to define what it stands for, what the commission stands for as an entity, right? Um, and that's very important because the EU is a working process and the EU does need to justify itself constantly to its public and to the world as to what does it do? What is it about? Why is it doing what it's doing? And one way of doing so is to say, here's where we are, here's what we stand for. And we do so before, before uh, others as well, before the world. And, and we are, in fact, in the case of the EU, we are your protectors. We are those who advance your interests and identities in the world. So it's not only um, a protection of identity, but it's also an affirmation and a construction of what European identity looks like. And don't forget that it's European identity is a, is a complex idea with 27 member states and it's a, it's a working process. So we wanna think, we wanna think about this uh, in this context. The third point that I'll make is of course related to digital trade itself. Um, and here we see, I think, a pattern that we've seen before in terms of contrasting the values themselves. And that is that on the European side, if you look at what the Europeans are saying is these are our values and our values are, well, we wanna protect consumers. Well, we wanna protect our citizens. Well, we don't wanna have business go crazy. Big mark, big companies go crazy. We wanna be thoughtful about that. We want to, of course, allow for competition as well. In other words, we want sort of a European style capitalism. And that contrasts with sort of a more, let's say neoliberal and uh, more pro-market friendly capitalism that is uh, that we often see in North America, right? Your liberal kind of approach. We've seen this story before. We've seen this story precisely in the context of uh, the negotiations between the United States and Europe that have failed, that I mentioned before, as well as with the, between the United States and Canada. Those things were precisely about, well, are we gonna let markets just do their thing or, we, or are we going to protect our consumers when it comes to the quality of food? Uh, when it comes to what they're eating, when, when it comes to the environment, when it comes to their rights. We've seen this story before, and I believe that here is, is, a, similar, is a similar moment, um, which is interesting. The difference here, though, which I find quite, quite uh, extraordinary, uh, is that, in fact, the United States itself, the government, is behind the curve. They are still figuring out how to do it with regards to digital trade. And in the EU, we are ahead, right? Or they are ahead, however, whatever your perspective is. So while the conflict is there, actually the United States government is itself thinking, how are we going to regulate these big companies? So that's a really big question. And in some ways, uh, as Benjamin, I think, kind of alluded to or addressed as well, we may be on the same team to some extent. Uh, we may not be against, we may not be as far apart as, as we think. The issue is that I think the United States government hasn't figured out yet what he wants to do. He keeps calling, you know, the Zuckerbergs of the world to Congress to testify and figure out, but they seem to be so out of sync with each other and they have to still figure out how they feel about things. And there's a big split here between the Republican party and the Democratic party as well. So in a way, the EU is ahead of the game and may very well be asserting things that will influence in the end, the American position itself which I think might facilitate one day a real agreement between the two parties. And the last thing I'll say is uh, the concerns the Biden administration. And here, I just wanna emphasize that we have a shift in, obviously, in the party that's in power. And we know, mm, depends on who you believe, that the Democrats are perhaps friendlier or have been historically friendlier toward big tech and the Republicans have gone after them uh, more aggressively in the past, at least. And so I think we're in, a, in, a, in, a, in an important moment in the United States in terms of you know, what are we going to do? And it'll be very interesting to see whether the Biden administration will stand for these companies as these companies interface with the EU or whether it will tackle them and regulate them here and then try to export those ideas as it deals as they deal with uh, the EU. So I think there are a lot of these sorts of dynamics that are worth thinking about at uh, different levels. So that's where I'll leave it at. Okay, well, thank you, Francesco. Uh, so uh, last but not least, we have uh, Urška Petrovčić uh, from the Hudson Institute, uh, who specializes in issues of competition, antitrust and intellectual property. Uh, and I'll uh, let Urška share uh, her thoughts as well. 
Yeah, good morning or good afternoon. And first of all, thank you for having me here. It's an honor to be part of this panel. Um, so yeah, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, antitrust, big tech, and topics that both Francesca and Andrea have already addressed to some extent. So yeah, it's difficult to talk about digital trade without mentioning digital platforms, as probably all of you know, digital platforms have been at the center of the policy debate, both in the United States and in the European Union, and frankly, in many other countries. And perhaps it's worth emphasizing already at the beginning that the term digital platforms or digital gatekeepers has been used broadly and might encompass different companies. It does, however, typically include at least the four big tech corporations. This is Google, Apple, Amazon, and Facebook. And as we have pointed out, these are all American companies. So in the last few years, we have seen several reports being published on the topic of digital platforms. In 2019, a small group of experts has published a report for the European Commission on this topic. Uh, last October, the U.S. House of Repres Representatives published a report on competition in digital markets, and there have been other reports, some published by um, public authorities, other published by research institutions, and all these reports reach the same conclusion. They all raise concerns that some digital platforms have gained too much power and that, that they might use this power in a way that is detrimental for consumers and the society more broadly. Now, when one thinks about the power of digital platforms, of course, there might be different concerns, some related to perhaps fake news, uh, others related to hate speech or perhaps political bias. All these reports, however, focus on a much narrower set of concerns, which is mainly how, do, how these digital platforms use their power to affect competition, which is exactly what Andrea was talking about earlier. So let me talk about this a little bit more in details. So the general concern is that this Digital, some of the digital platforms have gained so much market power that they're able to basically crash competition and through this maintain or perhaps expand the market power that they have. And we can think of many examples. In, in the European Union, for example, Spotify has filed a complaint with the European Commission challenging Apple practices with relation to the App Store and the European Commission subsequently initiated an investigation against Apple. And it's basically checking if the rules that Apple has adopted for the App Store harm competition in markets where Apple competes with other app developers. So for example, do these rules favor app, uh, Apple Music vis-a-vis uh, -vis Spotify? In the United States, the US Department of Justice has filed a complaint against Google, challenging some of the agreements that Google has executed with smartphone vendors, pursuant to which Google search should be the default search engine on smartphones and computers. And the question is, how does this affect competition? Does it preclude basically smaller companies to compete with Google. In Germany, there have been several investigations brought against Amazon and Facebook, all challenging how these companies use the data that they collect from their users and how the use of this data affects competition. So long story short, there is concern of how these big digital platforms behave in the market and how they are able to affect the outcome of market competition. What is interesting though, and as it has been already pointed out earlier, is that although there seems to be an agreement with respect to the concerns related to digital platforms, policymakers have put forward very different proposals on how to address these concerns. In the United States, the focus has been primary on antitrust law, which is the body of law that prohibits practices that harm competition. And, uh, Probably you have read about it. It has been uh, um, all over the popular press. Some commentators have raised concerns that the antitrust law in the United States is too lenient, 
that antitrust enforcement has been too weak for several years and that basically this enabled digital, these digital companies to gain the market power that they have today. And as a result, we have seen in the last month several legis legislative proposals put forward that seek to both compare more power to the antitrust enforcers, but also they seek to significantly expand the scope of antitrust law in the United States. And of course, these are just legislative proposals. They haven't been adopted yet, but there seems to be at least some bipartisan support for some of the proposals. And what is interesting is that these changes to antitrust law would not be limited to digital platforms. They would affect every single company that competes in the market. And as a result, some commentators have, have raised concerns with those proposals. They have said, well, we, we understand your concerns with digital platforms, but how are these changes to antitrust law going to affect other, perhaps smaller companies? What are the unintended consequences of the proposed changes to US antitrust law? Now, in the European Union, we have seen a very different approach. The focus is not on antitrust law or competition law as it's typically uh, referred to in the European Union, but rather on a regulation that is really focused on digital platforms. And here, perhaps, it's worth explaining some differences between US and EU uh, antitrust law. So in the EU, antitrust law is already very expensive. The rules are very broad and permit um, um, enforcers to address a wide set of practices. However, at the same time, there is also a general agreement in the European Union that antitrust law is not the right tool to go after digital platforms. They're basically saying, well, we have these tools, we have used them, and they have not led to the result that we would like to see. Therefore, we need to look for something else. And the concerns is not so much in the scope of the provisions of antitrust law, but rather in the speed of the intervention. As Andrea mentioned, antitrust law is an ex post intervention and typically it takes year to conclude an investigation. For example, in the case of the, um, of the investigation that the European Commission brought against Google, it took 10 years to reach an agreement. And in markets that are fast changing, as is the case of digital platforms, it, imposing a remedy after 10 years is unlikely to be effective. So that's why we saw that in December 2020, the European Commission put forward a proposal for a regulation, the so-called Digital Market Act or the DMA, that it's specifically focused on digital platforms and imposes on them specific duties, obligations, and some prohibitions. So um, this regulation would be limited really to just a few companies. And of course, as, as we ha Andrea mentioned earlier, the concern with this very tailored regulation is that, well, yeah, it might really address the conducts that we see now and that we believe are problematic, but is it flexible enough? Is it possible that these digital platforms will develop or adopt new strategies that are harmful, but will be able to escape the regulation? So this is the concern in the EU. So long story short, what we see on the two sides of the Atlantic is that policymakers have raised very similar concerns. They, have, they agree on the problems with respect to digital platforms. However, the measures that we have seen put forward are very different. They take really different paths. And in that respect, it will be interesting to see whether in the coming months there will be some dialogue between the two sides of the Atlantic and whether we will see some convergence in the measures that uh, regulators are planning to, um, to adopt. Now, perhaps before concluding, I should just uh, have a small disclaimer that of the description that I presented is very broad. And if you look at some of the digital of the proposals that have been presented in the US, you see that they are looking a little bit at Europe. There are some things that have been taken from the DMA. So there is some um, cooperation, but is definitely not very extensive. There is definitely room for more cooperations from the two sides. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Ushka. Uh, so we have uh, some questions uh, coming in, uh, but I would like to um, start the discussion uh, by uh, giving, I think, uh, kind of a conceptual overview. It seems like we have four layers uh, interconnected here, right? So there's uh, the connection, uh, the, 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 the level of uh, the regulation of, uh, of content in things like social media and other types of digital media. There's the market regulation, which involves issues of market access and competition uh, and antitrust. Uh, we then have the interconnected issue of taxation, right? And how are these services taxed and how does taxation operate, especially at the international level? Uh, and then we have finally uh, the political level, right? Especially at the international trade level and how these issues are coordinated between these two major actors, right? The US and the EU. Um, at the level of uh, regulation, at least we know at the level of content regulation and issues such as data privacy and so on, uh, the EU is somewhat a bit more advanced than the US. Uh, you know, there are various, there's an EU regulation, for example, that establishes all kinds of standards with regard to data protection. Uh, you know, many people in the audience, you know, might have experienced, uh, you know, the, uh, the fact of you know, when you go to a, a server that's based in the EU, there's a pop-up window that says, you know, this site collects uh, this data, here are the cookies, and do you accept or do you not accept, uh, which is required uh, by EU regulations, which you do not have in US-based sites, and they can just collect any data they please. Uh, uh, and so uh, to what extent is also then, can we say, thinking about market regulation, which is also quite new, or more recently, let's say in, in the US case, where there's some talk about thinking about antitrust and how antitrust could be applied towards, uh, let's say in the big tech, uh, the, 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 the gatekeepers, uh, as uh, Mr. Schwab said, to what extent is the EU, uh, you know, kind of a step ahead with, in, 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 in that regard as well? And I invite any of the panelists to give their thoughts on that. Yeah, perhaps I can start with this um, this question. Well, it's a very good question. The European Commission has been definitely working on this topic for many years. And they have been, even before talking about the regulation, there have been several investigations brought against companies. What is interesting that in the past, when the European Commission brought those investigations, it was often accused as, oh, you're going after US companies, it's protectionism. Now the debate has changed because also in the US, we have seen that uh, enforcers and regulators have raised similar concerns with some of these companies. Um, that being said, uh, although the European Commission had a head start, I'm not sure I would say they are ahead. I would rather, say that they both are working in this field of antitrust and digital platforms and they seem to have taken different paths so it's just different difficult to say who is ahead and who is not um, it, it is very likely that they might adopt different solutions just because there are such big differences between the antitrust law regimes um, in the two jurisdictions However, I do believe that some of the conclusions that have been reached after the extensive research in the European Union on this topic might be helpful for, um, for the regulators here in the United States. So I think like cooperation would be very fruitful to really identify those tools that would be most effective to address the um, the identified problems without causing unnecessary unintended consequences on other players. Thank you, Ushka. Uh, the uh, other related question or issue uh, would be uh, with regard to, uh, I think a critique that comes especially from the US side. So many uh, of these regulations, right, that are seen to target big tech right, uh, uh, and mainly American companies, right? The critique that you hear from the US side is that, well, these rules are basically uh, being made to uh, target 
these companies, right, to perhaps even limit their access. And, and, and this is in the context of a kind of a global competition for, uh, for tech, right? And this is a broader competition that involves not just the US and the EU, but also China. Um, and to what extent uh, is this critique valid or is it really just more about uh, a values-based uh, uh, idea of uh, creating kind of a, a, a level playing field in the market? And again, I welcome any of you to uh, tackle that question. Maybe I can say a few words. Uh, I think the data protection is rather a question of value uh, for us. The uh, rules that we have in our data protection regulations, the so-called GDPR, are extremely extensive. And the practice of the European Court of Justice in enforcing those rules adds an extra layer of ambition. So we have a, a very um, stringent set of rule and court jurisprudence that gives it um, a legal value that is uh, quite high and quasi-constitutional um, because of the ECJ jurisprudence that we cannot bypass as such. ECJ jurisprudence uh, is something that we have to, to respect. And the important thing I would like to stress is that the um, uh, comprehensive requirements which are set in uh, those legislation as interpreted by the court are to be respected not only by the companies, whatever the nationalities, but also by the administration. All the administration have to make severe uh, efforts to protect the data, even when they're working on topics like fighting tax evasion, uh, ensuring security and fighting terrorism, or, or, or conducting data research uh, in some medical field. So it's really a non-targeted approach, which is across the board. And we are trying progressively to uh, deepen our approach. The commission has, for instance, proposed um, yesterday, actually, a new uh, regulation on artificial intelligence uh, that follows a bit the same logic as the one we have on the GDPR, and that intends to set principle on what is acceptable and what is not acceptable as regards the use of artificial intelligence but with constraint primarily on the public authorities, which shows again that no one is specifically targeted and definitely not the US company specifically. It's more something which is deep rooted in Europe that we have to protect our citizens against uh, uh, encroachment on their privacy. Yeah, I, th I think that's some, some thoughts. I think they're built partly on this. Uh, if your question is, I think your question best was, well, is it protectionist, economically driven behavior, or is it behavior that is, uh, you know, propelled by values about certain things, you know? And I think that that dichotomy doesn't necessarily need to exist and be viewed that way. I think that the two things are often together. And so it's both, right? Uh, in that, I think that in this case, there's certainly a reactionary uh, instinct on the part of the EU and a little, bit of, a little bit on the defensive side, reacting to the platforms and so on and so forth. The size of these companies, the fact that they're kind of unregulated in the United States and they come in and, you know, and it's so hard to understand what the boundaries are and all the things that we talked about. Uh, but it's precisely in moments like this, there seem to, pre, there seem to be 100% about economic uh, reality that in fact, regulators and others, citizens and even economic actors stop and think about, okay, what, what are we about? What do we care for? What do we want to uphold? And what do we have already in place as Benjamin already said? And, and what does it mean about us? And then how are we going to deal with it? So I think this is a moment in which you see that and it becomes a chicken and egg thing, right? The, the values drive the economic behavior or, or vice versa. And I would say it's back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And I think you're seeing this played out. Uh, here, here. So. If I may just add something to confirm what Benjamin and Francesca said, uh, in antitrust, as mentioned earlier, this is an argument that is very often raised by commentators that you know the EU goes after foreign companies and that is a way of 
protecting its own industry. And what the European Commission very often points out is that it has many brought many legal action against European companies. There are many cartels that involve European companies. There are many cases involving abuse of dominant position. The thing is just that uh, the, those companies are not so big and because the fines are proportional to the turnover of the company, the, the fines don't make it to the headlines of newspapers, but they are they impose an equivalent, proportionally equivalent burden on those European companies that are subject to this um, procedure. So I believe that it's an easy point to make, but I'm not sure it's really supported by the facts. Basically, if I may just add one follow-up comment on that, and it's also the case, for instance, with antitrust and any other, uh, any other area where the EU has taken a position that it is a position that it has arrived after extensive internal negotiations and overcoming of national differences and the antitrust case with the Dutch doing one things one way, the Germans doing another and so on and so forth. So by the time they float up to the European level and they're agreed upon, they represent already something that has been processed and digested and fought over. It's not a random thing. So uh, that has to be taken into consideration. Yes, thank you for that. Uh, so we have a few questions from the audience, and uh, I guess this is uh, a question from uh, Tom Frost. Uh, this is, I guess, a bit more of a sort of institutional question in terms of uh, how taxation policy works in the EU. I guess this is uh, best addressed by uh, Benjamin. Uh, so what is the role of the EU taxation? Uh, uh, the common understanding is that taxation and fiscal policy is set by uh, member states themselves. And so what is the role of the EU in uh, uh, regulating uh, taxation? It's a more difficult question than it sounds actually. Um, <laughs> we're trying to make it work because we have uh, one specificity in, in, in the treaty as regards taxation, which is it is the only part of the treaty which still obeys to rather outdated decision-making rule. Well, normally EU law is adopted by what we call ordinary legislative procedure. That is, you put the parliament and you put the, the member states sitting in the council and the member states decide by qualified majority voting. For taxation, the European parliament has no role whatsoever. Uh, and it's only the member states with unanimity which uh, considering the diversity of the situations in member states does not make our life easy in the field of taxation, but it does not mean that nothing is happening. De facto, uh, in uh, the field of indirect taxation, for instance, we have for decades an extensive set of legislation around the, the value added tax, which is regulated at EU level, and which is even an own resource of the European budget. Uh, in uh, the indirect taxation as well, we have a set of legislation on energy taxation, we have legislation on uh, um, excise duties, so the duties you pay when you buy alcohol and, and tobacco. On direct taxation, clearly, uh, it has been for decades a, a very, very touchy topic for which it was difficult to build uh, a common EU approach, and we have so far failed, for instance, to engineer uh, a common corporate tax base for, for large companies despite 10 years of discussion, but it doesn't mean that nothing is happening. Uh, we have uh, notably constructed over the last 10 years an extensive set of legislation aiming at fighting tax evasion and tax avoidance via uh, not, only, uh, not only exchanging uh, tax information between member states uh, with a set of legislation which is growing almost on a yearly basis. And, and the last one was precisely on the digital sector because it wasn't the activity of the sellers on the internet platform. Uh, but we have also a dedicated set of legislation on the relation between parent and subsidiary, on interest and royalties, uh, and, and on fighting tax avoidance, which is uh, a growing priorities of the European Union. So the uh, handling of tax affair at EU uh, level is difficult, is slow, but is uh, experiencing a considerable development over the last decade. And there is now an extensive set of EU law in this field, which is growing. Uh, 
since uh, the uh, union is uh, discussing as we speak new legislation and important new legislation will be tabled in, in the coming weeks. Thank you, Benjamin. Uh, so we have another question. Uh, uh, so two related questions. One is by Sam Lewis uh, and another uh, by uh, Amarildo uh, Seca uh, on uh, this issue of convergence in regulation. So Sam uh, points out that uh, the US and the EU have uh, disagreed with regard to the culpability of social media companies uh, for the type of content that they spread. Uh, and uh, uh, the other question regards this issue of competition. Uh, and both questions regard this issue of convergence. So uh, would a consensus or convergence between the, U the US and the EU in these matters be desirable? Or should we, uh, you know, can we live in a world where uh, some of these rules can actually differ across uh, uh, the US and the EU and we can still have, uh, uh, you know, ensure that, you know, trade and digital access, uh, access for the digital companies is still made possible. I guess I'll take yeah. <laughs> I don't know if we'll discover. Yeah. It's like, those are great questions. Uh, yeah. I have to stretch my imagination to answer it. I don't know. Uh, because in part, the things that we all know about digital markets and services is that uh, we don't know quite where the boundaries are. I mean, it's one thing to say, can we consume, um, is it okay to have different regulations uh, about the content of Coca-Cola? Sure, you can do it in one place, you can put sugar this way and limit it that way and the other. But uh, I think the example that Sam gave in the Q&A was, you know, well, in the US, you seem to prefer to censor people who post bad things and uh, online and social media. And in the EU, you, you, you choose instead to uh, allow self-expression and don't want to censor that, you know, no matter how bad the thing is. I think it's a great example. Um, you know, you can imagine a world where you can say, sure, let's have a different, let's, have, let's, let's regulate that differently. I don't know that you have to agree to, re to have the same principles in both places, but that's an easy example. I can, I can imagine other cases where it's actually much harder to say, we're going to live with two different regulatory environments provided by the same service provider, uh, whether it's Facebook or Google or, or whatnot. So that's kind of my reaction. I guess it probably depends quite a lot on what you're talking about, but it, it is so difficult to really get your hands on what does what is a digital service, what falls into that basket and what doesn't, you know, and, and where the boundaries are. Did you have anything to add on this? I thought you were uh, getting ready to say something. Uh, yeah, um, I also have to use a little bit my imagination because uh, content um, is definitely not part of antitrust. But yeah, it's an issue that has been related to the digital platforms recently. And perhaps as an, um, Francesco mentioned earlier, here there is really this disagreement between Democrats and Republicans, right? Republicans are very concerned about uh, the censorship of uh, social media, right? They have voiced concerns with that. And that's one of the primary drivers that uh, uh, for the Republicans focus on digital platforms and on regulating them more expanding antitrust law. Democrats have been less vocal about this, about like censorships and so on. And they have raised different concerns with digital platforms. The EU has not, intervene so much in that because it wasn't directly affected or it has been less directly affected but they have clearly said the decision to whether to censor or not should not lie in the representatives of tech companies they said this has to be done by the regulators it has to be decided ex ante so in that way they have signaled we are not letting the market decide here we will the regulator will decide um, then with respect to the question whether we, we, it's desirable to have different regimes or not, well, I think historically the US and the EU have very different approaches to free speech. So it's now it's just, we are not talking anymore about the free speech in, in the newspapers or you know, political speeches, but we're talking on social media. So we had different regimes before. I 
it, yeah, I also am not sure that we need to have the same regulations for social uh, media. I can just add one element. Um, the, the commission has tabled a number of regulation on digital market and digital services in December and the uh, discussion is still ongoing. So we don't know what will be the final decision of, of the legislator, but we have tried to follow a very simple and common sense principle, which is what is prohibited in real life should be prohibited online. So if someone, for instance, would have uh, a very uh, racialist speech or call for murder or do systematic calumny, behaviors which uh, are likely to be prosecuted in most member states uh, when they happen in real life, the same should happen if they're online and there should be a responsibility to make sure that we don't allow the, the use of the platforms to multiply um, speeches that uh, are, whose content is deemed illegal under our national legislation. But Zawoska is absolutely right that there is um, a cultural difference. And um, most of our member states, not all, most of our member states uh, do not consider uh, that there is uh, no limit whatsoever to free speech and that you could, uh, for instance, uh, parade in the street with, I don't know, a Klux Klu Klan uniform and start saying that you, you don't like this category of the population or that other, that would be a, a legal problem in most of our member states. And as such, it does translate also into a, a difference of attitude as regards what is admissible or not admissible online. But this derives from the difference of attitude in everyday life on what is admissible in real life. That's for sure. Thank you. Uh, so uh, this is a question uh, for me, and perhaps uh, it's mainly refers to what Francesco spoke to uh, spoke about earlier and others if they wish to comment on this as well. Uh, but Francesco, you mentioned uh, the TTIP, the, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, which was a treaty being negotiated uh, by the Obama administration with the EU for quite a while. Uh, and then uh, it got uh, basically dropped by the Trump administration. This was a wide ranging treaty that would uh, 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 expand uh, uh, trade uh, between the US and the EU. Uh, is your sense that uh, under the new Biden administration, we might see uh, a revival of the TTIP or something along those lines that perhaps may also address some of these issues with regard to uh, digital services? Right, uh, it's all speculative. It's a good question. Uh, I th think I've read the uh, I've read about the notion of, in fact, expanding any future negotiations to include something about digital uh, trade. So I think that's in the cards. Um, I, I, I have to say that the Trump administration kind of killed TTIP, but it was pretty much dead to begin with uh, by the time they arrived um, in power. So it had already significantly faltered. Um, so it had already run into trouble to some extent. Um, as to whether the Biden administration wants to pick it up, I think the answer is yes. But uh, I also think from everything that I've understood that it's not a high priority at the moment. And so I frankly, if I have to predict anything, I wouldn't imagine that anything would be done um, soon at all. Not in this year, not next year. And I don't know that after that, they would have enough time to put something together. And I say that because there are other priorities uh, with regards to China, with regards to you know, other areas as well, the pandemic, obviously. They have, they have removed some tariffs. You know, there is de-escalation de on some of the tariffs that have sort of come up with under Trump. And so that's good. That's good news. I think they're moving in that direction. You know, the on steel and ter uh, steel and aluminum, there's also discussions about that and, and so on and so forth. Boeing, the uh, aviation subsidies, those things, it looks pretty good, I would have to say. But to go from there to having a comprehensive trade deal, I think um, I think it's going to be some, some time. But I do believe that if they do, this stuff that we're talking about today will be more present than it was before. Yes, thank you, Francesco. It seems also with the... Uh... 
the degree of politicization of trade in the US, that will be a challenge uh, given the fact that trade is much more politicized than even during the Obama years. Uh, that's, that's, that's persisted for sure. Precisely. Uh, uh, so uh, a question for, maybe this is for Ushka more than anyone else, but again, others can feel free to comment. Uh, uh, in your work, you also deal uh, with issues of uh, standardization, uh, especially of technology given the fact that many of these digital platforms uh, work on technology that uh, you know, must be able to speak to each other right across borders and across different platforms and systems. Uh, and to what extent uh, do issues of standardization kind of play into uh, transatlantic relations or the politics of regulation uh, that the, the, the you see? Uh, I think you, you have some work with regard to the issue of 5G, for example, right, and the 5G standards, uh, and there's also a lot of global competition around that. So to, to what extent do these impact uh, these broader issues of, of, of digital regulation? Yeah, that is a very good question. Um, so I think perhaps there are two points that need to be made here. First is the one about standardization and digital platforms, and I think the big digital companies have played a very important role in the discussion about standardizations, but mainly in relation to IP rights that are included in industry standards. And they have been promoting uh, devaluation of those standards. Now, this has been going on for many, many years, for a decade, and we have seen a shift a little bit in the policy, both in the EU and in the US. And um, there has been recently some convergence, the approaches adopted in the EU and the US were similar. They, were rec they recognized some basic principles saying, well, we need to have a balance. We need to have to recognize the, the rights of um, those that own patent rights that are included in industry standards, such as the 5G. But we also need to ensure that uh, implementers of industry standards can have access to the, um, to the essential technologies. So this has been an ongoing debate and we will see now with the change of the administration in the US, how this will change and how will this affect the European Union. But there is also another perspective of this uh, standardization discussion, which is the ge geopolitical perspective. Um, Standards like the 5G are currently developed through open standardization, where different companies come together, they discuss the standard, they, they address the different technical challenges, and they come up with the solutions that are truly amazing. 5G is really revolutionary, and it's supposed to bring what many have called the new industrial revolution around the globe. There are very few companies that contribute to these standards. And some of the most important ones are European companies. Uh, Ericsson, Nokia, those are companies that have for many years contributed to the development of uh, cellular standards. Um, there are of course also US companies that have made important contributions, but now we are really seeing that China is focusing a lot on this topic. They have the, um, they, have comp they have increased the number of companies that participate in standardization activities. They, are, um, they have increased their contributions and they really have uh, publicly announced their goal to try to become leaders in standardizations, both in 5G and in 6G later on. So there is this uh, geopolitical aspect that so far has been ignored in the um, in the standardization context, but that might have that might play a more important role in the future. And yeah, it will be interesting to see whether um, whether the U.S. and the EU will work together, you know, to become to maintain this open standardization process, or whether we will see each continent fighting for their own interest and uh, and leadership in this space. Thank you, Rushka. Uh, and uh, so another uh, question for uh, Benjamin, this is, uh, again, my question, but based on, on your presentation, uh, and again, others, again, feel free to comment as well. Uh, but uh, you uh, indicated uh, the recent uh, 
a proposal by the Biden administration uh, with regard to corporate taxation. So this goes beyond simply the taxation of digital services, but also corporate tax. And uh, one of the issues that's been uh, 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 raised with regard to this setting of a minimum corporate tax that all large corporations would be subject to, again, beyond a certain revenue level, uh, that it might uh, put uh, pressure or some squeeze on uh, the smaller EU member states that have low corporate taxes and in a way kind of use that as, as, as leverage for attracting uh, 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 business. Uh, and, and maybe this is a bit of, you know, too much of a political question, but to what extent do you think that pressure from the smaller EU states, smaller EU member states uh, might be a challenge to the EU with regard to uh, an agreement with the US with regard to this, uh, this uh, a minimum tax? Well, we we have read with interest the proposal of the new uh, U.S. administration. Um, some of them were expected, some were not. Um, the one we expected was the intention of the uh, new administration to bring guilty, which is a domestic U.S. system of minimum corporate tax to 21 person, because this was a campaign promise of Joe Biden. Uh, what was new is the uh, proposal to change the way it is calculated, because so far the system in the United States was uh, based on so-called global blending. So you were looking at the average taxation paid by all the subsidiary worldwide. You were putting it in a pot, you shake, you get the average. But that at such did not prevent companies from using tax haven, because somehow what you had in a tax haven could be offset with what you have in an iTax jurisdiction. Uh, and the Biden administration has announced its intention to move to jurisdictional blending. So you move uh, to uh, an average country per country. And then if you, if you have activities in the tax haven, those activities can be of a tax. So it, it is a fundamental shift. And the fact that they do it with 21%, which is a rather ambitious rate, a lot of sun here, very uncommon in Brussels, I'm sorry, uh, is uh, undoubtedly um, important for the current OECD discussion. Because so far, what was discussed in the OECD uh, was to have a system which is relatively comparable, but with a benchmark of 12.5% with one important difference though, it's effective taxation, not statutory taxation. Because usually the effective tax rate is for most country, much, 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 much lower than the one that you can read just reading the legislation because of all the tax deduction, tax credit and, and stuff like this. Um, I assume that the United States will have now an interest in having a more ambitious target which is logical because that would mirror the uh, extra ambition in their domestic agenda. Uh, this will have to be discussed in, uh, in the coming weeks and coming months as we will need to find a consensus in, in the OECD. And once there is uh, a consensus in the OECD on the EU side, we will need to trans transpose it and, and bring it to EU law for which unanimity will be needed. Uh, it's a bit too soon to know how our member states will, uh, will react, uh, but for sure it uh, will create delicate discussion with some of them. And I don't think it's, uh, it's a matter of small member states versus large member state. Uh, de facto, uh, you, you have in Europe some small member states with uh, relatively demanding taxation and some, some other with uh, more, uh, more aggressive tax policy. And the same goes for large member states for which you have also real differences. Uh, I think it's too soon to form a view, but it's very important nevertheless to keep in mind uh, that uh, whatever is agreed, we need to reach a sufficient level of consensus to be able to be transformed into a legally binding instrument. And this will be the, the challenge of the negotiation in the coming weeks and months. We have very little time. 
uh, this is not specific, specifically a European challenge on top because you, you, you need uh, for the OECD to get a global agreement. So on the minimum taxation, you need also to get country like China on board, for instance. You need to have agreement on what uh, you uh, include or exclude from the field. How, for instance, do you take into account the, the various systems to support research, which exist a bit all over the world? Is it in, is it out? How do you calculate the tax base? So uh, the, the gist is simple. The details are awfully complicated. <laughs> Uh, and it will be uh, an important challenge for the negotiator to try to uh, finalize this discussion on time. But I think there is um, a very important impetus and that the proposal of the new Biden administration, the domestic one, are, are ambitious and, and that the current OECD discussion on Pillar 2 is a unique opportunity to get rid of tax haven. Because if it is adopted, it is not that tax haven would have to change our tax rate. We are not forcing tax rate on anyone, but they will face a choice between increasing their own taxation or seeing the other countries take their tax base by overtaxing the flows going to them. And as such, we have potentially one of the biggest progress in international taxation just at the corner. You just have to make the last steps to get there. So for sure, a very important issue. And I want to also give an opportunity to other panelists if they want to comment on this issue or any other remaining issues since we are approaching the end of our time. OK, uh, well, uh, I guess we will. And on that point, uh, I mean, that's quite a, uh, 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 an important point to, 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 to kind of end on with this issue of taxation. Uh, so I think we've covered uh, quite a lot of issues with uh, regard to this area and, 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 and of digital uh, trade and also trade more broadly and transatlantic relations more, much more broadly. So I wanna uh, thank our panelists very much for their time. Uh, thank you, Benjamin, for joining us from Brussels and Ushka from uh, Washington, DC and Francesco from uh, upstate New York and uh, uh, Joe and Giannis, thank you for your presence as well. And thank you to all the participants and hope we hope to see you again at a future uh, event.